Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the David R. Kessler Lecture in Lesbian and Gay Studies. My name is James Wilson and I am the Executive Director of CLAGS uh, and I am delighted to welcome you to this event this evening. Um, before we officially begin, I just want to say that last year I had the great honor of introducing Cheryl Clark at our Harry Hay conference and I was incredibly intimidated and I was awash with feelings of inadequacy to have to share the stage with uh, this leader in arts, activism, and education. Uh, but it turned out I couldn't have had more misplaced anxieties. In the first five minutes after talking with Cheryl, I felt like I had a new friend. Uh, and by the end of the day, over martinis and lots of laughs, I felt like it was old times. Um, and such, I found out that such generosity of spirit is typical of Cheryl as a poet, community organizer, scholar, and mentor. And for this reason, I am delighted that Claggs is honoring Cheryl with this prestigious award. Uh, this lecture is made possible by the generosity of David Kessler and is a highlight of the CLAG's year because it allows us to honor someone who has made a lifetime contribution to the field of LGBT studies. And there was no one more deserving than Cheryl Clark. CLAGS is committed to nurturing the continued work in the LGBTQ communities and honoring the legacies of the pioneers and groundbreakers in the field. Uh, and for this reason, I would like to pause for a few moments before we begin our joyous celebration to acknowledge the passing of one of the groundbreakers in the LGBTQ studies and a tremendous friend of CLAG's. Uh, as most of you no doubt are aware, uh, earlier this week, Jose Esteban Munoz died and his loss has left many of us in the communities reeling. Jose was a CLAG's board member uh, in the 1990s and early 2000s. And to say that his mark in LGBTQ studies is indelible is an understatement. Our current board member, Andre Carrington, who worked closely with Jose, will offer a few words in tribute. Andre. Thank you all for being here. It's very good to have something to look forward to so much at what's a difficult time for a lot of us. Uh, Jose was not my hero, he was my friend. He did not save me, but inspired me. He believed in me and lent his support to me and to many others when no one else did and at times when no one else would have. I'm one of many academics who are queer people of color who would not have succeeded as we have in higher education without his example and his guidance. He made us more creative, more daring, more resilient, more unapologetically faithful in ourselves as queer people of color, in society, and in a profession that does not want us to succeed and often does not care whether or not we survive. It was his conscious, sometimes anxious care for our irreplaceable value to this world that made his work and his concern so dear to so many of us, even as his personal genius and long, difficult scholarship made him unique among intellectuals of his generation. It is Jose's commitment to being an intellectual in an anti-intellectual world, where it makes you queer to think and feel deeply about anything that the world is going to miss. Because I was privileged to know him personally, to have his signature on my intellectual legacy, to eat and laugh and listen and drink and read and ask questions and be angry with him and learn from him, I am better and we are all better because of the work that Jose did. If you would join me in a minute of silence, I'd appreciate it. Mm
Both Jose and Cheryl embody the true mission of our organization. CLAGS provides a platform for LGBTQ scholars, artists, activists, students, and public intellectuals of all kinds to explore issues that affect LGBT and queer individuals. We award a host of fellowships, such as the Martin Duberman, the uh, Robert Giard, the um, Monette Horowitz Dissertation Prize, and these are intended to support the efforts of students, artists, established writers, and emerging scholars working in LGBT fields. We offer a space for writers, academics, and artists to share their work in progress, and we help support the International Resources Network that brings people in LGBTQ studies from across the world together electronically. Uh, we also host seminars in the city, and in the spring we will continue to devote considerable time and resources to queer curriculum and pedagogy. Our calendar is constantly evolving and the spring calendar is just now taking shape and we're very excited about the uh, number of offerings and uh, range of offerings that we will provide. Um, so be sure to check out our website regularly, the clags.org. Uh, we have a Facebook page and I understand we tweet, I don't, but uh, I guess we do. Um, and if you are not already receiving our announcements through the listserv, please make sure that you uh, give us your information. We're happy to keep you on top of what we're doing here at uh, CLAGS. Uh, it is at this critical juncture and during this exceedingly difficult economic time that we need your help. Uh, inside your program is a membership, uh, information card, and if you are not currently a member of CLAGS, we would encourage you to become one today. Uh, and if you are a member, we hope that tonight's event will inspire you to dig into your pockets, go into your checkbook, uh, pull out your credit card, and help us out a little bit more. It really uh, means everything to us. Um, and as you may be aware, CUNY in general and CLAGS in particular have been particularly hard by the economic crisis that seems to be now the new normal. Most of our funding comes from individual membership, both large and small, and your support allows us to continue to offer events such as this one. So any help you can give, uh, as I say, even if you have given before, would be greatly appreciated. Um, and finally, I want to thank the individuals behind this event, particularly the CLAGS board members, many of whom are with us this evening. Uh, the CLAGS board is truly a working board, and they uh, devote tremendous amount of time, energy, and um, financial support to uh, make CLAGS a thriving organization. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't um, acknowledge the amazing CLAG staff and interns with whom it is no exaggeration to say tonight couldn't have occurred. Um, because of their incredible efforts, uh, so many of our events have been at capacity and very well attended. Um, and to this Luddite executive director, as I've already mentioned before, they have tweeted, Facebooked, and live streamed our events to make it possible for people from not just New York, but across the world to participate. Um, there will be a reception immediately following Cheryl's talk, so I invite you to come and uh, raise a glass of wine to our invited guests uh, and to meet with board members and um, the staff. Also, Cheryl's uh, latest broadside, a special edition, um, which is absolutely gorgeous, um, will be available for sale. So uh, I encourage you to uh, purchase one of those, and I'm sure Cheryl would be very happy to sign that. Um, and, oh, and also we have t-shirts. Uh, these, it turns out, are vintage t-shirts. They're our old logo, but um, <laughs> Clags never goes out of fashion, so um, please uh, purchase one of those. Uh, and now to the main event. Uh, we had two scheduled testimonial speakers this evening, but unfortunately Stephen Fullwood has been battling a terrible case of the flu, so he won't be able to join us. Uh, he certainly regrets that he could not be with us, but I assured him that we would all offer a collective get well soon. Uh, so Stephen, if you're watching, 
Get well soon. We're, <laughs> thank you. Um, and I am honored to introduce our eminent speaker, Elizabeth Lord Rollins, at this point, who will offer a testimonial of Cheryl Clark's impact. Uh, Dr. Lord Rollins graduated from Radcliffe College of Harvard University in psychology. After receiving her medical degree from Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons in 1993, she served as a clinical instructor at Harlem Hospital before joining Honesdale, Pennsylvania. Dr. Lord Rollins returned to New York in 2002 at the Ryan Community Health Center. She held dual appointments as assistant professor of pediatrics and assistant professor of obstetrics and gyne uh, gynecology at Mount Sinai Medical School, uh, where she concentrated her clinical, clinical time in adolescent gynecology at the Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center. Elizabeth Lord Rollins. I'd like to thank Clags, uh, James Wilson, uh, for having me here. It is a real honor and a, and a true pleasure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, is that better? Okay, terrific. Dr. Cheryl Clark, what am I to say? Shall I discuss her many accomplishments? which would take me all day and would sound like a curriculum vitae on tape, so that's not going to be too interesting, so I won't do that. Shall I expound upon some of her writings, which have not only launched black feminist theory and queer studies to new heights, but have been revolutionary in their intersection of African-American, feminist, lesbian, and queer nation issues and aesthetics? Shall I discuss what she means to me personally, as a foremother, as a mentor, as an academic who was and remains bold in her statements despite doing work in an academic world where we are often pressured to be bland in the name of an objective scholarship? <laughs> Shall I speak of her complexity? As she states, I find the choices I have made regarding my identity are made more complex by my choice of poetry as my expressive art. And yet, Dr. Clark has been on the front lines of scholarly work for a couple of decades now. Dr. Cheryl Clark, who can point to the black literary movement of the 1920s, the black arts movement of the 60s and 70s, the early fiction of Alice Walker and Toni Morrison, the poetry of Audre Lorde and Pat Parker, James Baldwin's Another Country, the black lyric voice of Langston Hughes, and the telling irony of the blues, all as influence. And, as we say in the surgical field, her influences include but are not limited to the <laughs> foregoing. I have no ability to speak of the private stuff. What I've mentioned is just the public stuff. Dr. Clark's unseen, unsung contributions, but I know they exist. How many careers has Cheryl Clark encouraged or made possible with her editing work for publications really too many to mention? How many hours has she made available for struggling writers by serving on selection committees for prizes that have been given? How many students has she kept off a midnight bridge by being available to them as director of the Office of Diverse Community Affairs and Lesbian Gay Concerns at Rutgers? I don't know. Dr. Cheryl Clark is a stone thrown in a pond where the ripples end is impossible to see but that body of water will never be the same. When Dr. Clark is in the house, there are no ripples. There are major waves. <laughs> I will begin with a story Jewel Gomez shared with me about her comrade. 
In the early 1980s, at a black feminist literary conference, Cheryl Clark, Jewel Gomez, Barbara Smith, and another young poet were informed that they would perform Pat Parker's movement in black in a plenary session, each poet taking a different part of the piece. As Jewel tells it, it was just sort of this edict that came from on high, and Cheryl wasn't really too pleased with that. She didn't say anything, but went up a bit. Well, I can just imagine how that might not have sat too well. You don't even pay me the respect to step to me and ask me to perform the piece. I have a voice of my own, one eyebrow up. But apparently, they went into session to rehearse. Pat Parker was sort of a taskmaster, so you know, there's some reactions there, right? But Jewel reports, there was a moment when all of our voices came together. Movement in black, movement in black, over and over. And I looked over at Cheryl and just knew that the importance of this work and the power of the moment, that's what it was all about for her. And that nothing was going to keep us from performing this work. The importance of the work, the power of the moment. To use some of her own luscious language, Dr. Clark has been one of the most trenchant observers of black arts and letters of the latter half of the 20th century and the first tenth of the 21st. And certainly in her early scholarly work, she was at first a very lonely voice, as she herself observes in After Mecca, women poets in the black arts movement. Critical engagement of the poetry of African American women in no way clutters the literary landscapes of either the black or the white West. But also notes, the words of women cleaved art and activism, creating dangerous binaries and new possibilities. Clark gives us a new way to understand the black arts movement. Poetry was a principal instrument of political education about the new blackness and there is even poetry in her academic discourse. Mecca, a trope of deliverance from Western oppression, is also a place of many deaths. The ultra-public roles, the rambunctious orality, and the communal commitments of the poetry of the black arts movement created turbulence on the literary landscape of Afro-America as the equally ultra-public unequivocal and loud calls for black power created the same tumults on the political landscape. From another passage, a riveting rhetorical power, a dramatic defection from the codes of black respectability and a high moral ground of blackness was assumed by many black poets. And yet, Cheryl Clark always, in every work, goes beyond the mouth-watering, sheer voluptuousness of her language. She never makes the simple argument and does not gloss over the contradictions in any work beneath her gaze, whether it is Angela Davis's heterosexual assumptions in her 1971 reflections on the black woman's role in a community of slaves, or omission of black lesbian issues in Michelle Wallace's 1979 Black Mock Show and the Myth of the Superwoman. At the same time, Clark does not let these works, or their authors, off easy. She pays homage to their importance, stating that the former, quote, critiques erasure of black women's role in African American survival, and that the latter contributed to conversations about sexism within the African American community. Even as she lauds, but some of us are brave as, quote, a survival manual for all of us stuck down here in this swamp of Western male letters." Unquote. She makes it clear that the collection suffers from a dearth of black lesbian voices. She is prescient, noting in 1981, even as a young woman, about that same volume, quote, I regret that the issue of aging is not raised here as black women's health problems increase as we age, and there are certain health concerns concomitant with aging. The neglect of this issue throughout this collection is regrettable. Her critical eye, unparalleled, 
When critiquing Erlene Stetson's essay, Studying Slavery, Some Literary and Pedagogical Considerations on the Black Female Slave, Clark reports it's a well-written piece, extols its virtues, and notes, quote, Stetson does not seriously examine the differential brutality leveled against the black slave woman. She chooses not to be critical of how white women exploited that analogy between their oppression in marriage and the enslavement of blacks. Clark's is a constructive criticism, however. She posits questions for further study. It would be intriguing to query the impact on the psychology of black women of the political sanction of centuries of violence. So this was the world in 1981 where one goes to a regional conference of the national black social workers and hears homophobic comments that draw a standing ovation from the crowd. Where one goes to the first national plenary conference on self-determination and has a flyer on one seat stating, quote, homosexuality is a genocidal practice. Homosexuality does not produce children. I would beg to differ with that one. And from the extreme right, federal edicts such as the proposed Family Protection Act of 1981, most of which made it into law, which stated that, quote, no federal funds may be made available under any provision of federal law to any public or private individual group foundation, commission, corporation, association, or other entity for the purpose of advocating, promoting, or suggesting homosexuality, male or female, as a lifestyle, 1981, folks. And although she writes in her essay, Lesbianism 2000, quote, I was not crazy or courageous enough to be a warrior, and I was too nonconformist to be a soldier, unquote. Her body of work would suggest otherwise. With her incisive analysis and rapier wit, woe betide because Dr. Cheryl Clark can come for you. <laughs> Whether it's calling out that director of the National Black Social Workers or her fellow black feminists, the issue of black lesbianism should have been integrated into every single essay prepared for this collection if we are truly serious about black feminist scholarship and practice. Lesbianism is not solely an aesthetic nor solely a sexual issue, nor an issue to be treated solely by lesbians. Yes, Dr. Clark can come for you. <laughs> In another essay, but it is these black macho intellectuals and politicos, these heirs of Malcolm X, who have never expanded Malcolm's revolutionary ideals beyond the day of his death, who consciously or unwittingly have absorbed the homophobia of their patriarchal slave masters. It is they who attempt to propagate homophobia throughout the entire black community, and it is they whom I will address in this writing. And that is from the failure to transform homophobia in the black community. In that piece, Clark challenges us to recognize class differences between the homophobia found in intellectual and working class communities, nor does she let her gay and lesbian community members off the hook. Quote, I sometimes become impatient with the accusations of homophobia hurled at the black community by many gay men and lesbians, as if the whole black community were more homophobic than the heterosexist culture we live in, unquote. And Dr. Clark is not afraid to include sex in our discussion of sexuality. In her poem, Sexual Preference, Clark writes, I'm a queer lesbian. Please don't go down on me yet. I do not prefer cunnilingus. There's room for me in the movement. Your tongue does not have to prove its prowess there to me now, or even on the first night, your mouth all over my body, then there. 
<laughs> Dr. Clark could have been a consultant for the recent movie, Blue is the Warmest Color. <laughs> Noting in her writing, lesbian sex, which itself is poetry, is and without beginning, middle, and end. Every time I see a young person in my clinic, whether he or she is straight, gay, bisexual, trans, whether his or her chosen gender expression is feminine or masculine of center, center or unnameable, if that young person is proudly wearing his or her choice, that young person is the direct beneficiary of not only Dr. Cheryl Clark's scholarly work, but who she is in the world. Just try mentioning her name, Cheryl Clark. You never get a neutral response. Do you mean that fine Cheryl Clark? <laughs> the one with the swagger? That unapologetic Butch, yes, that one. <laughs> the one who, with her bold and audacious claim on her own sexuality, frees us to do likewise. It is fitting that we honor Dr. Cheryl Clark today. She is a lion of literary theory with a prodigious body of work that supplies us with not only fresh discourse, but entirely revolutionary ways to view both prose and poetry. She has always refused to separate work from its political, social, and sexual environments, and we are all the richer for it. Her work lays the foundation for a new black feminist criticism and is an essential part of what will be the canon of queer studies. I have no idea what term queer studies, the scholarly exploration of LGBT culture, issues, and aesthetic, will be called in 200 years, but I have no doubt that it will exist and that we have seen its birth in our lifetimes. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Professor Sister Cheryl Clark. Y'all didn't see me almost trip over that cord, did you? <laughs> Thank you so much, Beth. And uh, thank you uh, for that um, humbling introduction. So I'd like to say we miss your mother. And in case I don't have time at the end, I'd uh, just like to read this poem to you. Echoes. There is a timber of voice that comes from not being heard and knowing you are not being heard noticed only by others, not heard for the same reason. The flavor of midnight fruit, tongue calling your body through dark light, piercing the allure of safety, ripping the glitter of silence around you. Dazzle me with color, and perhaps I won't notice till after you're gone, your hot grain smell tattooed into each new poem, resonant beyond escape. I am listening in that fine space between desire and always. The grave 
stillness before choice. As my tongue unravels, in what pitch will the scream hang unsung or shiver like lace on the borders of never? Recording which dreams heal, which dreams can kill, stabbing a man and burning his body for cover, being caught making love to a woman, I do not know. I'd like to thank Jim Wilson and the Clags Board for inviting me. Needless to say, I'm deeply honored and a little surprised to be here, nervous too. I was a member of, uh, a member and a co-chair of CLAGS from 1990 to 1992. I had good times as a board member and as I said, co-chair with Esther Katz and working with Marty Duberman and was involved in many good programs. I remember one year when Adrian Rich and Alice Walker agreed to serve as honorific co-chairs of our annual fundraiser. And Alice Walker happened to be in the city at the time of the event and wanted to attend. So it was OK. So Esther Katz and I had the honor of picking up Ms. Walker and her friend historian Robert L. Allen and escorting them to the Graduate Center when uh, it was across the street from the library. So that was one of many good times we had at Clegg's and I, I'm happy to see you're still going strong. As many of you in the audience know, or even if you don't, uh, I have been honored, asked to give celebratory addresses to students and colleagues, was given a fabulous retirement party in June by my beloved Rutgers colleagues, got a lot of nice gifts, <laughs> really nice. <laughs> Um, and I received a wonderful celebration of my work uh, on the Livingston campus at Rutgers in October, which was organized and convened uh, by a hardworking group of younger black queer troublemakers. Um, Darnell Moore, Stephen Fullwood, Alexis Pauline Gums, and Mecca J. Sullivan. And now tonight here at Clagg's at the CUNY Graduate Center. Uh, I gave my talk the title Black Queer Trouble in <laughs> in life literature and the age of Obama, so I could practically talk about anything <laughs> in the black, queer, lesbian, gay, bi, trans world. But I won't talk about anything or everything. And I'm going to begin before the age of Obama, almost before he was born. One, my mother, she tells me that Johnny May will grow up to be a bad woman. But I say it's fine. I'd like to be a bad woman too. And wear the brave stockings of night black lace and strut down the street with paint on my face. Two, I am an oversexed well-hung, 
black queen influenced by phrases like, I am the love that dare not speak its name. And you want me to sing, we shall overcome? Do you, daddy, daddy, do you want me to coo for your approval? Three, pass through me, dark to light, wash over me with rivers of joy, embrace me with your love, if I'll have you. But no, I'm no one's for the taking. No, I am not even mine for the taking. Four, I am a mannish dyke, muff diver, bull dagger, butch feminist femme, and proud. Uh, Gwen Brooks is bad woman, number one. Two, Essex Hemp Hills, oversexed, well-hung queen. Three, Samia Bashir's speaking clitoris. And four, an anonymous political poster, the Manish Dyke, Muff Diver, Bull Dagger, Butch Feminist Femme, and Proud. Ought to be enough to cause some black queer trouble in here tonight. <laughs> one starts to ponder what one has contributed and where and its future, and was it progressive, reformer, reformist, reactionary, in the service of institutional politics, in service beyond the boundaries of the institution, transformative, radical, or even revolutionary? What are the limits of one's allegiance, of feminist, commitments, of risk, of courage, of the politics of blackness, of erotic choices. In the summer of 1967, auditing Arthur P. Davis's course, Negro Literature in the U.S. at Howard University, I learned for the first time about black literary practice from Phyllis Wheatley to Leroy Jones. I learned that the reading of so-called Negro literature had been a primary means of communicating social injustices done unto black Americans. African American literature became a metonym representing global oppression and resistance of third world peoples. South African writer Peter Abrahams is inspired to write by reading Du Bois, Cullen, Hughes, Wright, claiming in his memoir, Tell Freedom, that their writings gave him a new vision of his own country which he left in 1957. My sense and experience of writing as an explicator of the absence of social justice emboldened me to emulate the dictates of the black arts movement and to write poetry. Having attained an R, see this doesn't resist the autobiographical. <laughs> Having attained an R&B and black arts sensibility, I set out from Washington, D.C. in 1969. I had read Frazier's Black Bourgeoisie, Alex Haley's autobiography of Malcolm X, Fanon's Black Skins, White Masks, Ab Tecker's The Documentary History of the Negro American, and Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. Why, what else would you need? 
I landed in New Brunswick on the Rutgers campus, met by the ballyhoo of a full gamut of political demonstrations by students and faculty. Anti-war, black power, women's liberation, gay liberation, and the kindness of, shall we say, strangers, all in jeans and t-shirts. Meanwhile, I was wearing an A-line dress and stockings. <laughs> I was. And gloves, I still have those gloves. It took me 10 more years, however, to catch up to lesbian feminism and the women in print movement that enabled and emboldened my contributions to our sex lives and political dreams, as Daniel Hurwitz from Hunter College said so kindly of my work when I spoke at the Harry Hay conference here a year ago. I am drawn back to the writings of black women who have fed my desire for troublemaking. Walker's The Third Life of Grange Copeland, Morrison's The Bluest Eye, Tony Cade Bambara's edited The Black Woman, an anthology, Angela Davis's Black Women in the Community of Slaves, Gerda Lerner's Black Women in White America, a documentary history, Shange's For Colored Girls, Smith and Bethel's Conditions Five, The Black Women's Issue, Moraga and Ansel Dua's This Bridge Called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color, Smith, Hull, Scott's, all the women are white, all the blacks are men, but some of us are brave, black women's studies. Smith's Home Girls, a black feminist anthology. The Black Unicorn, are dead behind us. Icon Magazine Special Edition, Art Against Apartheid. Whom did I leave out? You could just shout it out if you want to. Well? <laughs> you put me in <laughs> who else who else Jewel I said who Pat Parker who else June Jordan Barbara Smith I said Barbara okay okay all right I must also call out the names of the black feminist critics who followed Barbara Smith's call to be as daring as the writers themselves and who emerged during the 70s and 80s, beginning with Smith's own article towards a black feminist criticism, Barbara Christian's black women novelist, development of a tradition, Hazel Carby's reconstructing womanhood, the emergence of the black woman novelist, Deborah McDowell's essay, Nameless, Shameful, Impulse, Sexuality, and Nella Larson's Quicksand and Passing, Hortense Spiller's Interstices, a small drama of words, Claudia Tate's ethnography, black Women Writers at Work, Mary Helen Washington's Black Eyed Susan, Jewel Gomez's A Cultural Legacy Denied and Discovered Black Lesbians in Fiction by Women, Cheryl Walls edited Changing Our Own Words, Essays on Criticism Theory and Writing by Black Women, Gloria Hull's article, Under the Days, The Buried Life and Poetry of Angelina Weld Grimke. Beverly Guy Sheftel's 30 Black Bridges and Words of Fire. Writers and writing became the chief arbiters of a transformation of consciousness, intellectual, political, emotional, which is ongoing. Not merely instrumental, the novels, poems, plays, essays of underrated women, underrepresented 
women writers and cultural readings and public events, journals and anthologies became pedagogical and theoretical and critical guides by which to live. In her foreword to this bridge called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color, the late Tony K. Bambara charged us, the writers and editors of that enduring anthology, to, quote, make revolution irresistible. We know revolution is protracted, and so is a progressive agenda. Witness how accusatory people became about Obama's inaugural speech. Liberal progressive. And we said to Obama, hey, bro, it's about time at least be liberal progressive. <laughs> we also say deeds, not words. And I suppose supporting same-sex marriage, getting rid of DOMA, getting rid of don't ask, don't tell, refusing to sell women's reproductive rights totally down the hole is liberal progressive, but not enough. This talk will attempt to speak to black queer spaces of resistance and desire and black queer trouble and black feminist trouble, too. I am taking black queer trouble from Alexis Pauline Gums, a queer black feminist writer, poet, educator, online troublemaker, and founder of the Eternal Summer of the Black Feminist Mind, a virtual school of black feminism. Here, Gums defines the learning outcomes of her free online course entitled, quote, to be a problem, outcast subjectivity and black literary production. We will explore troublemaking, radical performative critique, and the transgressive and embattled act of visual, textual, sonic, and multimedia publishing as possible responses to systemic and individual exclusions. If publishing is an act of stolen power for outcasts, this class will be a publication of what it can mean to be problematic in a society inflected by race, class, sexuality, and gender norms. Our aim is not to solve the problems of classism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia as inflected by race, but rather to create a space where it is possible to act, speak, write, and think otherwise anyway. I say take that, University of Phoenix. <laughs> Can I, as a black queer troublemaker and feminist too, operationalize revolution and or progressive agendas? Can I trouble the liberal same-sex status quo enough to say it's not enough? Can I trouble LGBT communities to feed our hungry youth, both physically and emotionally, in ways their birth families, <laughs> relatives, and neighbors can't or don't or won't? Can I trouble our LGBT? Can I trouble our white LGBT allies to continue to challenge white domination within their organizations and to share the resources you have attained because of your white privilege. As I have become more assimilable, can I trouble the carceral state by advocating for and with survivors of it? 
by refusing unnecessary police presence in my gentrifying and gentrified neighborhood, and by demanding professional police behavior wherever I am and they are? Can I trouble my communities of color enough to counter their homophobia and sexism and black straight respectability? What account do I give myself in the context of the scourge of HIV AIDS among the most vulnerable people in my communities? Stephen G. Fullwood, in his piece, The Low Down on the Down Low, calls for accountability on the individual and group level in the black community in chilling terms. If a man is on the DL, that's his business. If he spends his time out having unprotected sex with men or women, contracting venereal diseases and bringing them home to his girlfriend, wife, or male lover, then that's another story. That's an issue of honesty, not sexuality, or to the point, homosexuality. If we can't talk to each other across perceived sexual boundaries, the walls of ignorance will just get higher. Ignorance will continue to be passed down from generation to generation. And perhaps, worst of all, after the dust has cleared, nobody will be left to talk about anything. Can I sustain the trouble? Is it enough to trouble in increments? Am I about changing myself, the courses of events, structural power, eradicating the carceral state, inequities of race, gender, sex, politics, material resources, money, and the harsh domination of immigrants and the working classes the world over? I turn to my sister of the plantain and the corn, Sheree Moraga, as she defines her feminist politics in the context of her hecanism, her Mexican native ancestry, and the frailty or strength of coalitional politics. We make and break political alliance as we continue to evolve and redefine what is our work in this life. As a hikana, I find the deepest resonance in that evolutionary process with my sisters of the corn, as Tony K. Bambara called native women. Indianism, north and south, gives shape to the values with which I raise my children. It informs my feminism, my sense of lugar, on this planet in relation to its creatures, minerals, and plant life. Ideally, it is a philosophy, not of rigid separatism, but of cultural autonomy and communitarian reciprocity in the 21st century. It is my sure-footed step along that open road of alliance with my sisters of the rice, the plantain, and the yam. What rituals, legacies, praxis give shape to our values? What does it mean to be still inspired by the black arts movement? To still believe the lessons of the black arts movement became a large house of resistance to patriarchal culture, black and white and to still believe in Amiri Baraka's 1969 dictum about literary practice as expressed in the poem Black Art. Poems are bullshit, 
unless they are teeth or trees or lemons piled on a step. Fuck poems, and they are useful. <laughs> Would shoot come at you, love what you are, breathe like wrestlers, or shudder strangely after pissing. Our work and our writing as black queer troublemakers are fraught with disobedience, resistance, and direct language. In these lines from her poem, Star Apple, Alexis Gums queries us. How to tuck home into cleavage and bring it out. Flower magic, how dare we be free, all out loud and in public and shit. Disobeying our penchant for black respectability, something we crave even as black queers, Essex Hemphill also faces off black macho culture by asserting a phallocentric masculinity. In America, I place my ring on your cock where it belongs. I remain convinced that there is no transformation unless black feminists and black queers, same gender loving in the life communities engage in a kind of itinerant movement from front to back to inside to outside again and again and unless there are parallel movements going and coming in the streets, down the alley, and in the house, whereby dynamic mutuality and exchange coalesce and contest. As Gloria Hall said of Audre Lorde's radical positionality of, quote, living on the line, we too have to live on the line between either or and both and, and engage in ceaseless negotiations of a, of a positionality from which we can speak, act, and make trouble, not settling, setting, or sitting still. A few words about lesbian feminism. Lesbian feminists did the work and the word. We took the potluck to new levels. <laughs> Most nights of the week, on Saturday mornings, Sunday afternoons, at meetings and on projects, at fundraising events for those projects, at the proofreading and layout meeting, after an afternoon of wrapping and trips to the post office with scores of parcels among us in somebody's old VW or Corolla, the lesbian feminist theater group, the tickets, the box office, the folding chairs, the posters, the feeding of cast and crew, or the cultural center and cafe, its readings and public programs, the film set in someone's loft <laughs> with 20 volunteers on hand to make up dress, direct, film, feed the cast and crew, the lesbian-led national conference on violence against women of color on a frayed shoestring budget and women from all over the country and the world come at their own expense and ours. The anti-apartheid publication celebration on an equally frayed budget under the aegis of a lesbian editorship. The all-volunteer lesbian health fair or the weekend-long board planning retreats. <laughs> Catherine Acey is out there. She knows about those. <laughs> Where we supplied the food and did the cooking, too. We produce politics and culture for us, by us, about us. Lesbian, lesbian feminism put our feminist messages out to our constituencies, other lesbians, and 
any women for whom women are an essential part of their lives, as we said at conditions. Lesbians of African descent were, are everywhere. Women of color, sometimes code for lesbians of color, were, are everywhere. Lesbians of all colors work very hard to produce for our imagined audiences. We claimed and challenged our masculinity, femininity, whiteness, blackness, as well as our androgyny and hybridity, liminality, and marginality. I know we celebrate this bridge, as well as homegirls, as we should, but I must celebrate Conditions 5, the black women's issues. Its guest editors, Barbara Smith and Lorraine Bethel, gave me the first place to call myself a black lesbian feminist. And white feminists and conditions founding editorial collective members, Ellie Balkan, Jan Clausen, Irena Klepfis, and Rima Shore gave the journal over to the project of black feminism and later to the project of women of color feminist leadership by committing the magazine to women of color. In their introduction to Conditions 5, the co-editors identify many of the obstacles to producing the publication, most of all the very perilous conditions of black women's lives. Quote, 12 black women were being murdered in Boston's third world communities between January 29 and May 28, 1979, while we were working to create a place for celebration of black women's lives. Our sisters were dying. The sadness, fear, and anger, as well as the unforeseen need to do political work around the murders affected every aspect of our lives, including our work on Conditions 5. And the editors go on to say that these murders and all other violence against black women necessitate, quote, the dire need of such a publication and for a black feminist movement. Let me call out some of the writers who appeared there. Gloria Hall, Renita Weems, Ann Allen Shockley, the late Linda Powell, Donna Allegra, Toy Derricott, the late Yvonne Flowers Maua, the late Pat Parker, the late Audre Lorde, Alexis DeVoe, Beverly Smith. Conditions 5 was my first encounter with queer black trouble. Some people ask, whatever happened to lesbian feminism? We were at that conference a few years ago. Actually, it was fun. Well, like many things else, it, is, it has gone virtual and viral, including black feminism and lesbian feminism, as the Crunk Feminist Collective enunciates in its mission statement and blog. Our relationship, quote, our relationship to feminism and our world is bound up with a proclivity for the percussive as we divorce ourselves from correct or hegemonic ways of being in favor of following the rhythm of our own heartbeats. In other words, what others may call audacious or crazy, we call crunk because we are drunk off the heady theory of feminism that proclaims that another world is possible. We resist others' attempts to stifle our voices, acting belligerent when necessary, and getting buck when we have to. <laughs> Crunk feminists don't take no mess from nobody. 
quite a change in tone from the rather distressed tone of Smith and Bethel, and also different from Gums's more teacherly reserved tone. The virtual anthology carries on the work of black feminist troublemakers. I started to say of your, then I realized I'd be putting my, but anyway. <laughs> Women's studies scholar and troublemaker Vivian May asserts in her article, Under Theorized and Understudied, an article on Harriet Tubman, a real revolutionary, and if not queer, a definite black troublemaker. That histories, May states that histories of this noted icon of black women's resistance tend to portray her as a superhuman 19th century anomaly, separate and apart from the community of black women in resistance to slavery. May further contends that were Tubman doing today what she was doing before emancipation, that is, armed resistance to slavery, leading someone's human chattel to freedom, ready to kill or be killed rather than be returned to slavery, which was still legal during the earlier part of her resistance, she would be considered a domestic terrorist. May continues to frame how we, quote, make over the radical facets and figures of black history in the image of black respectability. Tubman's historical makeover transforms her radical vision and resistance and at times illegal actions into benign symbols of progress and family values. This interpretive shift aligns her organized resistance to fit with narratives of the nation's deliverance from its past sins and to render a more tender portrait of the nation as a family. The salvific also reinforces problematic ideas about the state as an otherwise perfect system with its central tragic flaw, slavery, and its tragically flawed central characters, white citizens, healed over thanks to Tubman. It's imperative to consider how deliver it is imperative to consider how deliverance models draw attention away from the tenacious nature of the systems of oppression Tubman fought against in her lifetime and how they persist to this day. They live on in new ways. And we, as a nation, are still not delivered from them. There is room, there is some room for comparison between Tubman and Asada Shakur. Similarly, Tubman was branded and, quote, illiterate and insolent abolitionist who, when she was enslaved, was always, quote, getting in the way, unquote, of slaves' discipline. $40,000 for Tubman's capture, dead or alive, or, quote, the sooner she is turned in, the better it will be for all Southerners, unquote. Asada has been cited by the FBI as a domestic terrorist with a $2 million reward aided by the vaunted New Jersey State Troopers for her capture. For over 40 years, the U.S. has been trying to capture Asada, who was railroaded into life plus 30 imprisonment on very unclear evidence in 1977 that she murdered a New Jersey state trooper. This continues to tell us that the systemic racist oppression of African Americans, primarily in the context of the carceral state, is not only, quote unquote, the new Jim Crow, but really a 21st century replication of slavery, 
Once a slave, you're a slave for life. Once a prisoner of the state, you are for life contained, constrained, and surveilled by the state. Blacks have no rights, whites are bound to respect. An ex-felon has no rights, a citizen is bound to respect. Stop and frisk, shoot your shot, stand your ground, take your best shot. Asada continues to say that she is a warrior for black liberation. Angela Davis, herself not a stranger to wanted, uh, wanted posts, Angela Davis declaims, Asada is not a threat. If anything, this is a vendetta. Unquote. And at least I can say, like Michael Denzel Smith in The Nation Online, hands off Asada now and forever. I flew in on the cusp of the black power movement, but someone did not pay the bill, and here we are all left alone in our blackness. Black queer troublemakers, one of the more excluded and despised members of the black community in the United States, carry on the black power revolution's commitment to racial justice. And this in response to black, black drag artist Joe Mama Jones' comment above. I flew in on the cusp of the black power movement. And so I will claim that, uh, I will claim that for black queers and for that unfinished revolution somewhere in Atlantic City when Ella Baker walked out on the 1964 Democratic National Convention after the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was prevented from being seated as the real delegates to the convention, from, as the real delegates from the, to the convention. While we black queers were left alone in the dark, countering the sexual repression of the Nixon Mitchell Reagan Meese 1970s and 80s, black lesbian and gay writers appropriated that direct and aggressive expressivity of the black arts movement to continue black queer critiques of the ubiquitous racism of white America and the gender prescriptiveness and homophobia of conservative black communities most viscerally documented in its refusal to organize around the AIDS pandemic or anything else having to do with lesbian and gay rights. Here Jericho Brown reminds us, tell them Herman Finley is dead. Then tell them what God loves, the truth, the disease your mother's mouth won't mention. Black lesbians and gays enacted what Farah J. Grisman, Griffin, I'm sorry, black lesbians and gays enacted what Farah J. Griffin says of modern dance artist Pearl Primus in her portrayal of the Jim Crow car in the 1940s. Primus was able to embody body a particularly black paradox, quote, forced confinement and forced mobility, unquote. Can't set too long and sometimes can't go too far or can't be afraid to come back or must, like Asada Shakur, never come back. We too worked within the constraints to break free of them. And I'll close with this last. Mecca J. Sullivan's short story, Wolfpack, for the New Jersey Four, 
about the seven young black lesbians who were arrested, I think around 2006 in the West Village for defending themselves against a low life street peddler, exemplifies Griffin's metaphor of forced containment and forced mobility. A good story about the ways in which the press savaged young women is in the public intellectual in 2011, an online newspaper, and predisposed the court and the public to viewing them as the assailants rather than the victims. Sullivan's story is told from the perspective of four fictional young women who were sentenced from three half to 11 years in jail. Vernice, the character, one of the four, one of the fictional four, decides to make things whatever she wants them to be inside her prison cell. This story is perhaps a parable of places that could use some black queer troublemaking. Vernice, I am wrapped up in Luna, my girls, and the warm licorice sky. The man tears like a bullet through our night. Who asked you what you think, you goddamn elephant? So many things are going on in this moment. My skull loses its solidity and breaks down to mesh to screen. I cannot tell what part of the action is happening inside, what out. I see a man in pink come. I see a woman run away. I see fingers and DVD cases and a nugget of firefly. I see blood curled around stripes and Shah holding a silver-soaked blade. From one side of my ears or the other, I hear him say, God damn, God damn, God damned. I feel words popping like firecrackers inside my mouth, and I let them blaze the air. You are not a man. Your sneakers are cheap. Your clothes are corny. You have no job. You are not a man. Hands on your sleepy little dick. You are not a man. What you know about God, some white man in the sky, if your God doesn't know me and my big black dyke man, woman, God, fuck him, he doesn't exist. You are not a man. You are a joke. My first night here, I make a decision, pretend. I play games with myself, games like my mother used to play. I pretend to fool myself. Things are not what they are. In some other place, in some far corner of possibility, things are right. Still, there is always the ink running like blood up and down the newsprint paper. Killer lesbian, trial begins. Seething, sapphic swarm descends. Bloodthirsty pride attacks. When I can't tell the difference between inside and out, I decide. If I want to share my dinner with Anthony Jesus, I decide he's on my lap, his polka dot bib brushing my wrist. If I want to joke with Tehran and Shah, I decide they're on the cot with me, and we laugh. I wade through the sea of orange suits, eat my food, and do what I'm told. I try not to think in days how they close me up in darkness. I try not to think of how time is crusting over baking me deeper into stillness each time the moon brings a day to its end. On the morning after my first night here, someone puts a newspaper in my hands. The paper is folded open, 
And before I read the headlines, I find my name in the middle column. I read up from there, waiting back. I see the name of the reporter and roll up to the headline, Lesbian Wolfpack Howls Its End. This is when I decide to make things whatever I want them to be. From the space around me, I carve my mother's smile and a deep, wet, warm sky. I get up, tighten my grip, part my lips like two heavy winds, and say out loud, let's go. Uh, and so I finish. Thank you. Thank you. Jim? Yeah. Jim wants questions and answers. <laughs> but I think we should have... I think we should have some lights, Jim. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm oh, never mind. It's rolling dark. Do you know how to do this? Sorry. I don't know. I spoke into it most of the time. Can you do this? No. No. Okay. That's Here better. Go. There we go. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Can Questions? I Can I start? Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, it's been an it's been an honor to um, be here. Um, thank you for bringing the work and the inspiration to me as a black lesbian. As a black lesbian, it's um, sometimes it's very difficult um, because. When we think of feminism, we have all our struggles as black women, and it's hard sometimes to take it out there. We get lost in the politics, the poverty, the war, and I carry it with me. Thank you for bringing your literature. Um, my question to you is, um, we lost a great hero, um, Nelson Mandela, and I was wondering, um, as feminists, as activists, um, what can we take from his life and if you could just reflect, just give me some inspiration. Give us some inspiration because the struggles will continue. Life goes on. The issues will always be the same. So I'm just looking for some inspiration. That's a big question. <laughs> but... Um... I'll take a stab at it because I have been thinking about that today. Well, there's so much we can take from his life. Uh, his devotion to a large world, a large vision, uh, his leadership, uh, his ability to shepherd others into the struggle for uh, against uh, uh, that iron bound system of apartheid um, I mean, maybe some other people should answer this. You know, I well, I just think it's person. it's it's <laughs> it's just well, yeah, courage, right, right. See what did I tell you? <laughs> Forgiveness. That's a big one. Not not 
not hating. He sat in that jail cell and made things the way he wanted them to be. That was a long time to spend in jail, though. That was a long time. 27 years, Jesus. But, like you said, he, uh, he made it a university for himself. And um, he was there with many of his comrades. That can't always be said of many of the revolutionaries in this country during the 60s and 70s that went to jail here. Thank you for that question. Thank so. you. <laughs> hey, Cheryl. Yes, Blanche. <laughs> Cheryl. Oh. oh, yes. Any um, advice for Shirlene McRae? <laughs> Shirlane doesn't need any advice from me. Well, we all know Shirlane. She didn't hide the fact. She did. Well, you know, maybe y'all, you, you, you know, you need to go to her and say what you're gonna do for lesbians now. <laughs> What's your husband gonna do for lesbians? No, I don't have any advice. For Shirlane doesn't need my advice. Shirlane's doing all right. What'd you say her husband was? Shirlene. <laughs> she worked with us on conditions, you know. Well, we all knew her. We did. Yes. I'd like to ask a question along that line. Um, new York City just elected a new mayor in large part on his pledge to reform, stop, so-called question, although there's never any questioning, and frisk. And uh, the mayor's first appointment is the police commissioner straight <coughs> out of uh, Rudy Giuliani's uh, era, who uh, gave us stop and frisk, and increased stop and frisk in Los Angeles. <coughs> And the new mayor keeps talking about how he's um, going to be a great progressive. So my question to you is, is he for real? Are you asking me that question? I don't even live in New York. I mean, you know, I mean, what can I say? This is y'all city. I mean, you know, and I'm not trying to deflect, you know, but... Um, uh, Bratton did do a good job in Los Angeles, and that was that, that was that was a bad town around black people. I mean, you know, police. You know, so I I don't know. Maybe that's a question to ask Shirlene. Were you in on Were you in on Bratton's hiring? <coughs> did he ever say he was going to get rid of stop and frisk? Yes. But he isn't now. He's sort of gone back on that, right? No, it's really a small What? It's unclear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what? Well. Well, see, there you go, Blanche. Stop and frisk is like chemo. That's what he said. Who said that? Oh. A little bit will help and too much will kill. Oh. Yes. Really? So, Isn't that interesting? So we're going to have to wait and see. Is that a, but yes. No, That's not no a question. question, Cheryl. I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say, um, you know, throughout the whole <coughs> evening, um, you have just taken me down the road, and I want to thank you so much for being, um, just as Beth was saying, so central in the lives and in the politic and in the emergence of so many of us. And you have now, then, and forever inspired me, and I just um, want to lead another round of applause for all the wonderful ways. <laughs> okay.
No, really. And for you to take it in, because you're always just, no, no, no. But yes, yes, yes. And thank you so much. Well, thank you, Gina. We went down that road together. Don't be. Um, hi. My name's Simone. Mm -hmm. um, recently, I have felt lost as a young, non-academic, black lesbian feminist in a corporatized nonprofit sector, I have been uh, dismayed um, at the dissonance between a movement that I had idealized when I was 16 and rereading all of the work of the Kambaki River Collective. And in my lostness now, I have gone back to reading all of the black lesbian feminist literature that once made the world make sense. Mm -hmm. um, one of the statements that stands out the most in this bridge called my back is the statement of the revolution must be irresistible. And I wonder how we're doing. Um, I think that irresistible means joyful and whole and compassionate and nurturing. And I, I ache for that and can't find it. Um, and so I wonder in the moment that we're in historically, both around the world and here in the US and here in the city, as it relates to making a movement that is vibrant and based in love and connectivity, um, where do you see us on that journey and how can we get closer? Uh, well, uh, I, you know, I think to make Tony, Tony Cage's statement to make revolution irresistible, um, that was a hope, I think. I, I, I look upon it as something that must be pursued. Uh, I personally don't find it irresistible. I think I find it hard, difficult, um, disappointing. Um, and uh, can't always be engaged in. I mean, sometimes you have to go off and do uh, other more reformist kinds of things. However, I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just hopeful, but I, I do, you know, as I was reading some uh, work from younger and newer black feminists and feminists of color, I, I, I see us continuing our work. I, I don't I see us still being emboldened and enabled, um, not only by the work of the past, but by the current work. Like, you know, that, that uh, passage I read from the crunk feminists. Crunk feminists don't take no mess from nobody. Um, so, I guess that's what I think, and I think it's real, uh, extremely important and uh, crucial and critical for younger people to find communities or to find community, younger feminists to find community. Um, and uh, because I don't, I don't think uh, the work we have to be about is anything we can do by ourselves. So uh, the old work is good and the new work is good. So I would say read it all. What'd you say? Occupy? What'd you say? Well, you need to be up here. <laughs> Occupy. Uh, uh, <laughs> Oh, everything. Sure. Uh, you seem to have made a conscious... Don't be asking me no hard questions, friend. <laughs> I, I told you I came to embarrass you, but I know. I'm not going to do that. No, you seem, you seem to have made a conscious effort to use the word queer. 
And I've had like a number of younger people of color seem to get angry at me when I use that word. And I'm wondering why you've chosen it. And what do you think about it? Well, um, actually, um, I like it almost as much as I like lesbian. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I find it an umbrella term, and uh, I find it an inclusive term, and it doesn't necessarily have to be derived from sexuality, but it could be crunk. But, um, well, you know, as we, we, we have to learn how, we had to learn how to use it because we work with college students and you know they they got you know you couldn't you know you had to you had to spruce up your vocabulary a little <laughs> you had you had to be able to say queer without you know like um fainting or something <laughs> at at meetings I remember one time using it, and this was a long time ago. This was in the 90s. <laughs> and I used it in some um, correspondence to some, um, you know, actually uh, lesbian and gay uh, alums of Rutgers. And this one guy, uh, you know, I don't know how he knew I was black. You know, because that, that was the day, days before the internet and everybody's picture was, you know, your picture was, ends up, you know. <laughs> but you know, he, he left, he left, um, he left uh, a message on my um, machine at the office saying, you know, Miss Clark, I caution you about using that word queer. You should kn know. You wouldn't like me to use the N word. Except he didn't say N word, you know, like we say now. He said the word. You know, and I said, like, well, wow. I mean, and like this was 1993. So, I mean, I guess I've been using it a long time and, uh, but even before then, I've always felt it was kind of sardonic and, you know, um, you know, it's one of those words you reclaim, even before queer nation. So I don't know if that answers your question. I know you use that word, friend. Because you have to teach those students, too. Oh, Kathy. So um, I've been here from Texas for like three weeks. And Pardon me? I've been here from Texas for like three oh, weeks. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and um, I wanted to say Put thank you. Put on watch. Yes, Put on watch. And I wanted to say thank you, Cheryl, like personally, for um, writing an introduction to our book. Oh, I'm, so, And okay, I have good. a book for good. you. Thank you. Thank you for and coming so, up here. Yeah, and so I wanted to... Um, say that the work continues, right? And so um, Cheryl's touched my life really personally, and I just want to say thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Our, uh, Kath, Catherine Acey, uh my old boss from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you were always the boss, Oh, Cheryl. that's right. I was you were boss. always the boss. I that's was right. the boss. <laughs> So I want to ask you a real difficult question. Um, but first of all, thank you. That lecture was brilliant. As usual, uh, I think you have moved uh, hearts and minds tonight. Um, a couple of things. One is, could you talk a little more about the importance of creating community, not just finding one, but us needing to create community over and over, um, but also to appreciate what's there as a rock. The other thing. Um, I feel a sense, an absence, though, sometimes. Um, some of it's nostalgic for the way we could gather or did gather um, mm -hmm. in, in different times, um, particularly cultural and arts events that inspired and moved us that were political and fun and erotic and very mm -hmm. multidimensional. 
and, um, and also intergenerational. And I'm just wondering, do you see an absence or uh, experience one, um, or are we just, or am I just not looking in the right places for that kind of uh, experience? So it's two things. Um, the first one was, how do you create community? The importance of creating community. Well, of course, I'm going to say it's important. Um, well, to a great extent, I think uh, one has to begin to create it uh, wherever one is. And I don't think we still, or I don't think we have the luxury to just look for one kind of community. I think that... Um, If I see, so oh, here, here I go again. If I see something happening on my block that I don't care for, like unprofessional police behavior or not enough police behavior because of the kind of community I live in and who lives there, then I have to talk to my neighbors about that, don't I? and see who, who wants to join with me to do something about something. I mean, that's a more immediate kind of thing, I think. And then, I don't know, I, I have to create it wherever I am. I, um, on October 4, uh, there was an event given uh, for me at Rutgers, and it wasn't just old people like me who came. <laughs> I mean, it was really intergenerational. And it wasn't about me. It was about that intergenerational um, uh, happening commitment. So I, 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 well, I'm nostalgic for the old days too, but, uh, you know, I could do without the potlucks because I <laughs> never, I don't ever want to be loading food out of my car again. <laughs> but I had to do it not so long ago in Newark. Because we went to feed, well, we went to do Thanksgiving dinner for some LGBT kids at, um, at um, and I don't even live in Newark. I need to be doing something in Jersey City. But, you know, we had, we, uh, you know, uh, we did a Thanksgiving dinner for about 40 kids in an after school program. Uh, in Newark, and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I think it was wonderful. Uh, yeah, it was. But you know, <laughs> you just cannot carry those things like you used to be able to. <laughs> I. Don't, I <sighs> Were you going to ask a question? Um, So I, I suppose I want to say if we don't feel we, well, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Uh, if we don't feel we have the community we want, I feel we, we do have to create it. And uh, maybe some other people can answer this question. Um, other? Well, yeah. time for two more. That many? Okay. 
Uh, thank you for bringing Pat Parker when you called her out into the room, uh, because she's not a, really an academic kind of person, but she was such a vital person in my life. Well, she certainly. was. Yeah. Uh, my question has to do with, there are a number of popular culture black women who are closeted lesbians, and they're in the public eye. And there are a number of, talking about black queer troublemaking, some of the youth, uh, queer black youth, are very angry that these people, these women, are not, have not come out. And I just wondered, how do we talk to our youth about the reality of what it means to get to a position of visibility, what it means to come out, and, and how, do, how do you negotiate that, that conversation? Who are we talking about, Queen Latifah? <laughs> no, in fact, Queen Latifah and Wanda, I mean, have made steps to let people know, but there are others that yeah. I don't want to, not about name calling. Well, uh, I guess I would, I guess I would, I, we were, somebody was asking me about that today, earlier, you know. Oh, I know. My partner's hairdresser, he was saying that. No, he, he, no, he was saying that uh, he felt that if Dana, that's what he calls him, because you know he's from Newark, um, <laughs> would come out, it would be so good for... Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, or the press brought her out. Or, I mean, anyway. But that's not the only one you're talking about, and I don't mean to belittle your question, but I guess I would just say to the youth, you know, be proud of and emulate the people you know who are out. Get off of that celebrity kick, you know? You know? Or if you feel, I mean, you go and be a star and come out. <laughs> you know? I mean, they, uh, I think young, young people need, need some, you know, they need, that's what I'm saying. You know, the one thing I've learned in, I guess, I think the last few years of working at Rutgers, thank God I'm not there anymore. But <laughs> young people, not just queer young people, but queer young people too, really. Um, they need more constructive interaction with adults. They don't have enough of it because their parents don't let me don't don't let me get on my uh, bandwagon now. But like you know, I I was reading that it was hard for me to believe all of the uh, stuff in that article yesterday in the Times on AIDS, the face of AIDS. You know it. Not, not that I don't believe uh, young men of color, black and Latino, are um, more at risk for HIV infection than anybody else on the planet. That's, that's not. But, you know, you wanted to say, well, like, who are these, you know, families? You know, why? Why are they still saying the things they're saying to these young people? And the young, we need to trade those people in. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I, I think there's a lot to be done, obviously, for young queer people, young LGBT people. Young LGBTQIXYZ people. Hi, Ms. Clark. Um, Hi. Thank you very much. It's been an amazing, amazing lecture. Um, I had one question specifically about how to construct queer communities, or how, I'm sorry, how to look towards queer communities as spaces of radical and like honest truth telling and reconciliation and healing. I'm sorry, let me speak louder. You have to talk louder <laughs> and slower. I'm looking for queer spaces as radical truths, uh, spaces of truth telling, of healing and reconciliation. Um, and thinking about, especially in the university and academia, 
how much forgetting is done in terms of where these, uh, where our ancestors, the trauma that our ancestors have gone through, uh, the traumas that we go through today, and thinking about how, I don't know how else to say it, but liberal queer critique often makes that harder. Um, queer critique? I'm sorry. <laughs> how liberal queer critique makes that harder sometimes. The, the, the preclusion of liberal questions, of, of liberal critique and queer spaces. How it, uh, it I'm sorry, I'm not articulating That's not right myself. That's right, people apologizing. <laughs> If I could It's always, it's at the center. If, if it's not at the center, it's like, it's so reactive. How do we have a preemptive type of space for dialogue and community to, to construct? So you're saying, how, how do LGBT people of color, black and of color, and allies, and allies have a space <laughs> where they can... Can even be an um, academic, because I'm often where there isn't that there isn't that space in academia now and it's like I Well I th I think you have to create it. <laughs> Don't you have to create it? It's not gonna, you know, it, it doesn't it's not gonna just be there. Um are there not what school are you go? What? Vassar College. Oh Vassar. There must be some. <laughs> um, there, there are no um, queer organizations of color. There are. There definitely are. But you don't like their politics. It's not that I don't like their politics. I think. Hmm. You're going to have to do like Nelson Mandela did. You're going to have to bring them all to you. <laughs> and have some kind of dialogue around how can we address our issue. And it might be that you're going to have to start more locally and globally. You see what I'm saying? We don't need to do that. Okay, well, others want to answer you. That's all right. What's your name? Star Mover. Star Mover. You can say Thank you. All right, I want to encourage you. The, the, the reprint of Living as a Lesbian. Uh, it's a sapphic classic from Sinister Wisdom. <laughs> and Midsummer Night's Press. And I think Julie Enzer is selling it. And then um, there's uh, my own uh, many broadsides. Your Own Lovely Bosom. It's 10 poems, $10. I don't know how, yeah. how much the book is, though. So, Jim? Yes, uh, at this point, please uh, help yourself to wine, cheese, and snacks. And thank you again for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you.